Hey folks, so we're meeting up now for the fifth and final reading of Henry C. Carey's, not Henry C. Carey, I'm sorry, <laughs> mm. Matthew Carey's Matthew. New Matthew Olive Carey. Branch. Yeah, same spirit, different person. Um, Sam has been gracious enough to guide us through this journey for the past five weeks. I'm really happy that we did this. It really gave me a, a much greater appreciation for some of the early uh, battles that, you know, we sort of take for granted, like America has been around for 250 years. And we missed the battles and how close the U.S. came to falling apart on so many occasions. And were it not for the, the highly epistemologically developed uh, individuals who took the stage of history at times that they were needed to clarify the purpose and mission of the United States and the idea of natural law upon which the nation had been built and around which the sacrifices had been devoted in 1776, it, it, it wouldn't have survived had it not been for these key individuals. And I think the reading through the writings of Matthew Carey really, for me, gave me a, a deep appreciation about the, the contour and the structure of the battle especially at the time of crisis that he was writing it, just coming out of the, the, the War of 1812. Um, today we have just, a, I think, two more chapters, right, Sam, is it? Or one more chapter? Three, three more, but they're not three that more. long. Okay, cool. Um, Sam, before I hit a screen share, is there anything you want to say before we lunge into it? Or uh... No, just uh, thanks, everybody, who's been along for this ride. Uh, it's been great going over all this. We've uh, encountered some uh, a revealing quote, for example, by Thomas Jefferson about how mm -hmm. he uh, changed his uh, his outlook in the late 1810s, early 1820s, after the War of 1812, and really exemplified this era of good feelings um, where the country was kind of united around these principles. And um, unfortunately, after uh, the presidency of John Quincy Adams, it was uh, destroyed by Andrew Jackson and the people who came after him, like um, Martin Van Buren and um, Polk Franklin and Pierce. Pierce, Polk. Yeah. Uh, and really, it was revived by Lincoln, and uh, it was made uh, much greater than it was in the 1820s, um, thanks to Lincoln and Henry C. Carey, who was Matthew Carey's uh, son. So he was carrying on the legacy of his father, the legacy of Alexander Hamilton, and all who even came before him, which I spoke about in um, in one lecture on Leibniz and, and Vittel and the roots of the, uh, the American system. Um, one thing I've been contemplating quite a bit lately is um, how ideal tariffs are for raising revenue for the government. You're, you're able to um, reduce the tax burden on your citizens and pass it on to foreign companies. So you, instead of taxing your citizens, you're raising revenue, um, but you're raising revenue off of foreign businesses and uh, you're also allowing your own domestic industry to develop. So um, there's sort of a, a lie put out by the free traders that uh, tariffs are, um, you know, a tax on everyone for the benefit of the few. It's, it's an argument that Matthew Carey addresses in this book. Um, but uh, there's a quote from Otto von Bismarck when he's giving a speech in, uh, in Parliament urging Germany to follow the American system. And he talks about how the burden of taxation is they, they've managed to raise all this money and develop America, he means, has, has managed to raise all this money and develop, and still with a taxation burden that is barely perceived, as, as he puts it. Um, so I've been thinking about that lately, about how ideal uh, tariffs are as a economic uh, uh, utility. Mm hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a very important. It it has so many purposes, right? But but 
being a source of revenue as well is is an important one and it does yeah. alleviate any type of obligation to try to like extract money from your citizens through unnecessary new types of taxes that could go on forever on top of i mean that's a secondary feature of it of course the, the primary one is the ability to have a power to build up the the productive powers of your nation in order to attain sovereignty in a legitimate sense but there's the other there's many other facets to it right yeah it just has all these benefits mm -hmm. Around All further right. too, and beneficial to those that use it. Just think of the levies that were put in uh, just about every port in the world. Great. Uh, yeah. very, I mean, you know, as Matthew said, I mean, how would you go trying to run a taxation system based on income tax back in those states? Let's think Roman Empire, for example, is merely one example. Chasing up your citizens to try and pull money out of their pocket at a time like that would just not have been possible. Whereas any trading port that was in your purview and everything like that was a perfect source of revenue and justifiable revenue too yeah and last week we saw a quote in the book and previous chapter where he compared the different forms of taxation and um and he mentioned direct taxation which is what they would call an income tax back then and um you know, the way he put it was that that sort of tax was intolerable. That was the thinking back then to go and tax somebody's income directly. In fact, it only came about uh, because of World War One in uh, the United States, and it was supposed to be a temporary war measure only. Um, and we know how that went. Yeah, it's interesting because in in preparing for some of the work um, for Mel Kay. Who asked me to do the, the little presentation on Lincoln's greenbacks? I was reminded through Anton Shakin's work of the um, one of the conditions of the New York uh, bankers under James Gallatin, around which you know loans would be uh, given to Lincoln in the North. Which one of the conditions was, on top of a variety of other intolerable things, that direct taxation of the people would be done would be applied by the government federally. And Lincoln said, "No, we're not gonna we're not gonna do." do that which is sort of a proto income tax later on it took them a while to <laughs> to figure out how to get that back into play but you know they've been Interesting, trying for a huh? how they they obsess over that mm -hmm. and um they really hate the the protective tariff they're okay with the revenue tariff a little bit mm -hmm. but uh, when it's a protective tariff um and you're building up your the sovereignty and the uh, national um, in, uh, economic independence and national independence of your country, they're really against that. And so um, the, part of the direct uh, income tax is that um, they make the employer take it out. I mean, you can't even, how do you protest it? You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, your employer takes out all the taxes and just, you know, sends them to the government for you. How nice. Mm -hmm. Can I stop in here a moment? Yeah, of course. Sure. I was actually over there listening to Anton Shaken and I lost track of time and I got here late. But what an amazing moment to come in on what Sam was saying. And it's like that picture just exploded inside of me. I literally feel it to have the protective tariffs in place protects your own manufacturing. It builds up the what's the word your lifestyle your your livelihood social it, capital it builds, mm -hmm. it builds up the livelihood of your citizens <laughs> and then whatever is imported they have the income to choose to buy some of the foreign goods if they want to because their own livelihood has been built up and protected and when they do buy some of the imported goods, the tariffs that are paid on those, that can be the revenue for helping to build up our infrastructure mm -hmm. instead of taking it from the citizens so much the way we are now. That is an amazing picture that we just really need to just sit on that and let it grow in our minds because that's the way things are supposed to be done. Yeah, I'd recommend going and listening to the speech from Otto von Bismarck. It was in um, 1879 to the Parliament on the uh, on the American tariff um, and the way he describes it. 
how it's uh, a burden uh, so light as barely to even be perceived. And and they've managed with this to to do so much. And uh, it's it's really a great speech where where he urges Germany to follow the same path. And and they and they did. Mm. I can see Arlen is dying to uh, to say something. So go ahead, Arlen. Dying might be a little strong, but thank you for noticing, Sam. Um, so in listening to some of the different presentations about this time period that uh, Matt has given with Mel K's show and some different presentations that seem to be coming up right now, which is very interesting because I was not uh, very uh, cognizant or fluent in this period of history. But the, the how do I put it, the... Uh, Champion, championing of, of oh tariffs are going to uh, create both wealth for the government. Tariffs are going to create prosperity in our industry for manufacturing or whatever the tariff scheme is is designed to do. I guess the question that comes up, there's two things that well, Sam said. One comment about he referred to they a couple of times, and I, I wanted to. I, I can't remember the exact specific thing, but the but it was it was that there was a party that was behind the notion of imposing. Um, actually, it wasn't specifically about the tariffs. Let's skip that. But when Britain was saying to the colonies, "Oh no, no, you can have slaves and you can pr pr produce cotton and you can produce all everything from the land, but you can't do manufacturing," that is a version of tariffs from them, from, from the, the, the British uh, uh, to the colonies to say we're going to control or, 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 or even say forget controlling what you're going to do in your co colony, we're going to protect our industry. Like mm -hmm. where does the line come of when it is unfair advantage from a colonizer, a city of London, uh, a British uh, controller, and oh, no, we're going to look out for the well-being of Americans or Canadians or whatever country you happen to live in, and we're, we're going to impose these tariffs which will affect and control the import and export of goods and how they are uh, both generating income for the government as well as how our people uh, interact with the product. Who, who are you asking? Or just anybody? <laughs> Anyone, nothing. The, the point mm. is that the tariff, yeah. the notion that tariffs are good to generate a, a positive position for the country that is imposing them, yeah. isn't that what Britain was doing when they said to the colonies, no, 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 you can't have manufacturing in the colonies. You guys just produce the raw materials. We'll do the manufacturing so that they are protecting their own industry. How is it different between okay. what Britain was doing or what America is doing or what anyone is doing in that, in that I'm, I'm not, I'm not voting for or against. I'm just trying yeah, to. No, I get your, the, I get your question. Yeah. Um, I would say it is, that it is the same thing. Well, mm, I wouldn't. When I mean, you're, when you're erecting, what do you, what do you erecting a protective, uh, when you're erecting a protective tariff, you aren't saying to the other country, you can't develop, you can't have your own industry. You're just saying, uh, we want to uh, protect our own domestic industries because it's crucial to uh, being a sovereign and independent nation. One thing I think is a crucial point to grasp. Um, I think about this quite a bit is let's say for example canada were to erect a protective tariff on car cars being imported okay because we have domestic auto manufacturing we want to protect and nurture and um uh we so we so we say we're going to enact uh tariffs on cars being imported well there would be a big difference in um the tariff that we would charge on uh, on a car from Germany versus say a car from India because our level of competitiveness with Germany is very equal to our own they have very high labor wages for example their uh, economy is highly developed as well so 
we are on a very equal footing compared to Germany, and therefore the tariff would not be the same as a developing country, which has very low wages and uh, which can afford to do what's sometimes called dumping, which is selling things uh, very cheaply, sometimes even at a loss, in order to um, uh, destroy your own native manufacturing that you have in your country. So it's, it's an important point to grasp that uh, the protective tariff should be done on a country by country basis ba based upon your uh, comparative advantage between the two of you and how easily you can compete. If you can easily compete with the products in that market because you're on a very equal footing, then the need for a tariff is much less. Yes, that is very right, Sam, but it's not the case yeah. since the last two centuries because of the global plutocracy. Um, maybe the last two centuries is a little bit too much, but let's say the last No, I don't think so. I think you no, know, I think yeah, two centuries is all have more than too. more than accurate. <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's say yeah. and there's all the, kinds of there's all kinds of economic and political realities that I didn't address there in terms of yeah. why India has been impoverished. Like India was twenty seven percent of global GDP in seventeen yeah. twenties. The British crushed that. They literally came in and destroyed their manufacturing mm. base. Yeah. You know, so there's a lot of history there that I'm not addressing. Uh, I would say the British was a little bit more savage than the Turko -Mong Mongols who ruled India for the two centuries prior to that. I just want to give a little number. Um, between let's say 1532, when the Grand Mongols created their dynasty. And from their mother's side, they, they are offspring of Genghis Khan. And from their mother, father's side, they were the offspring of Tamerlane, the Turkic conqueror. So they ruled India from 1532 to, let's say, 1757, when Robert Clive was victorious at the Battle of Plassey. And during those uh, uh, two centuries and a half, about 650 families control 50% of India wealth. Uh, that's called plutocracy, but it was not the Azael, <laughs> the Azael American establishment, but it was the Turkic, the Mongol, Iranian plutocracy. Mm -hmm. So I would say that the English were maybe a little bit more savage in their exploitation, but because they, uh, their capital city was at London, and the capital city of the Great Mongols was at New Delhi, okay? So even if they were foreign rulers, since they were living in the country, <laughs> the exploitation, let's say, was a bit more humane since they lived in the country. Interesting point. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting point, and um, I thank you for that. Um, it's definitely uh, an oligarchy, right? They're ruled by, by the few, 650 families out of however many hundreds of millions that they had. And I want to add, uh, oh, I'm sorry to for interrupting you. Uh, keep on, I wouldn't keep on. No, I was just, I was just going to say was how much of it was um, like a plutocracy though, if they were quite economically strong, they had very advanced manufacturing, for example, compared to much of the world. Plutocracy I think of as like the looting class, these like parasitical looters that we have. It's more of a klepto. Um, and often... A klepto kleptocracy more isn't that yeah yeah well <laughs> how do we define plutocracy can we just define say, can we define plutocracy quickly yeah yeah, yeah. maybe maybe we have yes, different yes, definitions yes. okay I, I would say that the grand moguls were almost an aristocratic oligarchy because they developed india okay because uh, and they created a lot of beauty the taj mahal for example was a, a legacy of the grand moguls uh so of course, they were the rulers, they were at the top, they monopolized the riches, but at the same time, they gave back to a certain extent. So that's why I would call them at the most plutocracy. The British were plutocrats in their own land, okay? They beautify London, they beautify England and so on with the money they got, but they were cacocrats or cacistocrats for India because uh, 
India was simply uh, a place to be exploited because they did not live in New Delhi or in Delhi at the, at the time, but they live in London. So I think here uh, we have to put into account the phenomenon of colonialism, colonialism meaning the peripheral mm -hmm. centers, mm -hmm. if we can call them centers, or the peripheral mm -hmm. spaces, were there to be exploited. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have a little bit of a difference in behavior from the British, either when they are in London or in England, or versus when they are in India, OK? Uh, so, uh, and since the Great Mog or the Grand Mughals live in India, even if 60 and 650 of their families monopolize the riches, they still beautify, beautify the space because they live there. Mm -hmm. Makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. and, uh, say there, was again, a, there was a great book um, by a economist Hajun Chang is a recent book, so it's in the more modern times, called Kicking Away the Ladder. And uh, it's all about how every modern Western nation developed by protectionism, and then they kick away the ladder, which is protectionism, and they say everybody has to have free trade now in the in the modern era. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's a very, very good book, and uh, um, recommend it. Uh, forgive me to interrupt before I forget, because that point is very important. <laughs> I don't want to forget. The upper classes family, the upper class families in India and Pakistan, okay, are not always, but very often, the offspring of the nobility from the time of the Grand Mughals. Okay, mm. so uh, there is still a certain continuity in that uh, uh, plutocracy, even if the the fact that the British came in 1757 and between 1757 and 1858 when Victoria has been proclaimed Empress of India, uh, it was the uh, East uh, Eastern India Company, the East India Company, which ruled the northern part of India and the the the, the Mughals emperor between 1757 and 1858 they were simple puppets for the East India Company. Mm -hmm. So I have another question or comment there. So it's much like in the in the United States, our politicians are supposed to live in the district they represent. <laughs> so they're supposed to be, you know understanding their constituents and their constituents concerns it's almost that same way with what i think it was juan was saying about them actually living in india yeah yeah they are but... seeing the results of their policies I and they're say... living among the people can i just kick in yeah. one thought on that very important point susie um in looking at what Hamilton was doing with his national bank, which is often slandered, right, as being a proto Federal Reserve Rothschild bank modeled on the Bank of England, blah, 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 versus what came before, what other alternatives there were. And then looking at what Lincoln was doing when he was like fighting to create again a national banking strategy around the greenback system, uh, but also bringing about some harmonization of, of, through his bank acts is that in both Hamilton and Lincoln's case, um, there was a very strong in, uh, demand that the directors of the bank live in the United States. In the case of Hamilton, you have, you can't be a foreign, um, you could invest in the bank. You could, you could reap uh, profits by the activities that the bank engages in that are going to be tied to real world investments. Sure. You can get a return on your investment by being a, a co-owner within the bank. But if you want to be a bank director and decide policy, you have to be an American citizen living in the United States. So there was a big fight to like really do what Quan was saying. Uh, that that thing that made uh, the the plutocrats of India viable as as a as a, an economy, and then Lincoln did the same thing, saying that no, if you want to to be a, a to receive a federal charter under the Bank Acts of 1862 or 63, you had to have at least 75% of your directors of the whatever bank in whatever state living in that state. So they would live through the, the effects of their, the, the consequences of their economic actions. Yeah. 
But I, I would like to say Hold that, the, yeah, but I would like to say that the global plutocracy nowadays is much greater than the grand moguls, okay? Because uh, they can have an address. Let's say he is the representative of Washington DC, okay? He can have have a home at Washington DC. But so what? There, yeah. Okay, that guy has at that guy sure. has at least fifty homes across the whole planet. Yeah, mm -hmm. Gr granted, true. Yeah. Is, the is same this thing in Australia too? Exactly the same thing. Hmm. It, in Australia, it's the same thing. I mean, it's, are, mandated, are you, it's mandated that you have to live in the uh, electorate that you uh, seek to represent. But you know, just having your name on a title is enough to make you a resident. Right. right. So, is this concept that? that's b bouncing around right now is that the core of nationalism like that that there are regions these different regions about the world where a group of people identify in, in some particular way and they say hey we want what's best for our brethren or people around us and so then they enact action which could be tariffs or uh like what what matt was saying about the the owners of the well, the banks, the financial system, the interests of the financial system are are, are coming home to roost. That there is a that there is a, a core that is not this this blanket, this this uh, spider web of, of 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 all over the world. Like what Quan was saying about the the plutocrats of today. Where fine, I got twenty six houses in every major center in the world. Where where do you want me to be? I'll be there. Um, so. You know, you come back to this notion of, of again, what Quan said about the 650 families in India, that, that there is, um, and Susie commented on the same thing, that 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 there's an interest for the people around me, that, that I live on the planet, in the world, on the ground, and and I have a base of, of, of operations where the I care about what's happening so that I don't rape and steal and and denude the planet of it of all its resources that 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 could create that notion of um, of caring about not just one's own wealth and one's own you know benefit but but the surrounding the people around them which could come back to instead of that the, the that bigger spider web net over the whole world, that it is more of a getting even right back to the tribal notion, which of course even more core would be family, but that that it, it, it's perhaps a smaller world that one focuses their interest and in their, um, you know, who am I protecting? I, I start out by protecting my wife, I then protect my children, then I protect my community. And and sure, somebody halfway around the world, which I want what's best for them, but I do am, am going to protect what's in my own region. But b before I cut off, the the point that Sam brought up, and all coming back to this whole tariff notion, is who determines? He said, okay, so we're competing with Germany, Canada competing with Germany. We're in a similar uh, social status of, of where wages and and and. Uh, Com you know, lifestyle and comfort is, is similar com versus, uh, you know, India or some other place where, uh, you know, they're willing to work for cheaper and, and build a cheaper car and ship it halfway across the world and, and, and come in on a, on a cheaper price to, to gain market share, which I talked about a couple of weeks ago about the Chinese furniture coming in at under the cost of the actual materials. So my, my point is, again, bouncing back to the Sam's comment of the they, that there is a they that, that determines what? What the interests of each nation are, what the interests for each product, uh, uh, product, um, what would you call it, uh, a range of manufacturing or industry. We want to protect this part of industry, but not that part of industry. Um, how do we ma manage such a, a diverse uh, potential when all of the other players across the world aren't playing by the same rule book. Yeah. So we can say, okay, let's make what's best for, for in, in Canada, for my city, for my province, and then for my country. And I'm going to play fair and I'm going to try and do, you know, take into consideration these different elements. But when halfway across the world in, in whatever country, there's somebody who's like, I don't care about anybody. I just want the profit. I want the control. I want. I want to ruin that that market share so I gain it. How do we 
putting that to bear. Yeah, how well, do we get? Yeah. I mean, it's the government that sets it, right? These things are constantly revised, you know, four, six times a year type thing. Um, how do you get good people into government? I mean, this is yeah. like the, the million dollar question. I exactly. think if this I takes one good leader <laughs> in one country or a few good leaders that just get tired of all the bullying and then they get together and they just put the bully in their place, you know? Exactly. I think Exactly. Well, I, 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 uh, sorry for inter uh, Have you finished, Alep? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that, that what is happening now is the answer to what Arlen is speaking, okay? Because the, uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't know how to qualify them. If you have a good word to qualify them, suggest me that, but I would call, I would call them the Western plutocracy, okay? Mm -hmm. Because the Western plutocracy is the most powerful one now. And I, I'm sorry, but I don't think that it's so easy to bring them down. The only way to bring them down is the coalition of the major sovereign countries which exist nowadays, and I know that I'm biased, but the, the three first sovereign nations which exist nowadays, they name are Russia, China, and Iran. Okay, I'm not saying that they are the, they are the only solution, but they are part of the solution because the most... Uh, overbearing and the most uh, exploitative entity existing on planet Earth nowadays, I call it the KFC Azrael, or if you want to be polite, the Western plutocracy. I don't think that the average ordinary citizen is capable to bring down the KFC Azrael. It would take uh, the participation of powerful countries outside of the West, and I name the three that I believe in. It doesn't mean that they the only one. And there's a kind of multipolar movement that is, uh, uh, that is beginning now, okay? And it can take two, three generations because I don't think that it would, it would be solved in the next 20 years uh, because uh, uh, the KFC Azrael uh, will not just sit down and just wait for their downfall. They would react. And that is the extraordinary... Uh, events of our time okay so i stop here because i get too much excited because it's my favorite <laughs> subject uh, it's my my favorite subject because history history is truly changing now and we are lucky enough to it. be alive uh, to, to yeah. watch it yeah I totally yep. agree uh i just want to say matt you were correct kleptocracy was the more correct uh term plutocracy is uh, rule of the wealthy only whereas kleptocracy are like ruled by the looters and exploiters exactly. say it again i'm sorry sam say it Kle i can't kleptocracy kleptocracy oh wow okay. yeah yeah because they are aristocratic plutocrats but the word klepto that to me that signifies those rulers yeah, uh yeah. they're rich by stealing yes. yeah exactly yes yeah. exactly <laughs> Yeah. Not by like fair, what do you call or, it? Fair prosperity. Yeah. I, or, or, even, or, or, or even under the kleptocrats, you have the cacocrats, okay? The worst. The worst, yeah. yeah. What, what yeah, is that? Of the you're say, say it again, Juan. What is that word you're saying? The worst? The cacocrats. 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 Yeah, cacocrats. Kakistocrats is the long version, but you have a short version. Kakocrats. Kako? So it's K-E-K-I-S-T. K-A-K-O-Krats. Kakocrats. That's the short version. The long <laughs> version is Kakistocrats. Okay. Rule by the worst. It's a good one. Exactly. Oh, okay, sorry. All right, let's do this. Let's, let's go. Let's finish let's the last go. three yeah. chapters, and then we'll we'll shift back into some dialogue dialogue gear once more mm, okay. right so who uh who will be today's voice who would like to read and sam read i can definitely read you yeah. one second i'm just adjusting my did i make it bigger I'm sorry i know you can read will you read Asleep. Yeah, <laughs> we know you, man. <laughs> Only if you will read too, Susie. Um, 
Okay. So we're on chapter 16. Fostering care of commerce by Congress. Monopoly of the coasting and China trade secured to our merchants from the year 1789. Revolting partiality. Wonderful increase in tonnage. Act on the subject of plaster of Paris. Law leveled against the British Navigation Act and the rapidity of legislation. The records of American legislation bear the most satisfactory testimony of the transcendent influence of the mercantile interest and of the unceasing exertions made to fence it round with every species of protection the government could bestow. No fond mother ever indulged a beloved child more than Congress has indulged commerce, attended to all its complaints, and redressed all its wrongs. My limits forbid a detail of the great variety of acts passed for the exclusive benefit of commerce, with which the statute book abounds. I shall confine myself to a few of the most prominent and important. Number one, the second act passed by the first Congress contained clauses which secured to the tonnage of our merchants a monopoly of the whole of the China trade and gave them paramount advantages in all the other foreign trade. The duties on teas were as follows. Bohi teas per pound in American vessels, nine cents, in foreign vessels, 15 cents. Suchong and other black teas in American vessels, 10 cents, in foreign vessels, 22 cents. Haisan teas in American vessels, 20 cents, in foreign vessels, 45. And in all other green teas, 12 for American vessels, 27 cents in foreign vessels. The annals of legislation furnish no instance of grosser or more revolting partiality than is displayed in this act, which established the first tariff. A pound right, just, of this, this, this just means that American vessels bringing in tea from, from Asia have to pay this amount uh, for their product that they're bringing in versus a foreign vessel doing the same transaction would have to pay more. Is that all that I'm looking at right now? Or is there something else happening? Pay this um, duty. Whereas if it was a British ship or a Spanish ship, they'd be paying double. Bringing it in, then they were charged a much higher duty. Yeah. Okay. All right. So he's, he's saying, he's saying the very first Congress had the protection for commerce, not for manufacturing. I don't know what happened. Sorry, I, I lost my connection. Okay, no problem. Paid 25 cents more duty than in an American vessel. Whereas a yard of broadcloth or two yards of silk Cambric or Muslim value five dollars paid by twenty five cents altogether, or five percent. Thus, the foreign ship owner was at once shut out of our ports beyond the power of competition for the benefit of the American merchant, whereas the foreign manufacturer was invited in by a low duty, and the possibility of competition on the part of the American manufacturer wholly precluded. Let me not be misunderstood, as if I regarded as incorrect the decided preference given to the American merchant. By no means. My object is to point out the immense inequality of the treatment of the two bodies of men, which to the great discredit of our legislation and the incalculable injury of our country, as I hope I have proved in the preceding chapter, runs through our statute book. This is a digression which the occasion called for. I return. Number two, the same act gave our merchants an additional decisive advantage by allowing a discount of 10% on the duties upon goods imported in American vessels. Number three, such was the fostering care bestowed on the mercantile interest that the third act was directed wholly for their security. By this act, the tonnage duty on vessels belonging to American citizens was fixed at six cents per ton. On American-built vessels, owned wholly or in part by foreigners, 30 cents. 
and on all other foreign vessels, 50 cents. Number four, in order to exclude foreign vessels from the coasting trade, they were subjected to a tonnage duty of 50 cents per ton for every voyage, whereas our vessels paid but six cents and only once a year. These four features of decisive protection were enacted in a single session, the first under the new government. They placed the mercantile interest on high ground and gave it overwhelming advantages over foreign competitors. In fact, they almost altogether destroyed competition. I shall state their effects at the close of the chapter. Can I ask you a question difficult. real quick? Mm -hmm. I can't remember which reading it was, but isn't there also a mindset at this time that they are trying to overcome that growing, farming was a noble occupation? but manufacturing was less respected at the time you're Good, saying yeah. in 1789 when what he's talking about now or he's talking about the 1820s when the book was written because um part of, i'm not sure but just part of what we saw at the very beginning was people like thomas jefferson changing his views after the war of 1812 and recognizing the, the importance of protecting manufacturers but um, in Anton Chaitkin's latest uh, talk he gave with Mel Kay, he gave a fantastic quote from Thomas Jefferson from this period, it's around the 1789 uh, era, where he talked about how we hope that our citizens will never be found in a workshop and that they will all be farmers and that the people who work the soil are, you know, God shines his blessing down on them or something like that. And um, uh, we hope that all of our manufacturing can be done in Europe. That was, I'm paraphrasing, but that is a quote from right. Thomas Jefferson. That and this report was, on and he, the subject. He talks of about how he was, uh, Thomas Jefferson was, was, was broken. He was sort of um, corrupted. Thomas Jefferson's political career was over. And then these plantation owners from the South came and resurrected his political career saying, you have to be the voice of the South. So that before Thomas Jefferson was much more aligned with Hamiltonian um, values. He wasn't, you know, he didn't see eye to eye with Hamilton on everything, but he became, you know, the voice of the plantation owners, the voice of the Southern interests because his political, his political career was over. And uh, these um, wealthy Virginia families came and rescued him. I really recommend right. going and, and watching this latest uh, interview he gave just the other day. Um, he, he goes into it in some detail. It was really good. Yeah, I was trying to watch that just before you started here. Hmm. That report on the subject of manufacturers that we read a few months back, what time mm -hmm. period was that written? That was 1791, Matt, I think. It was It was the first Congress. It was um, Hamilton was trying to uh, convince uh, the Congress and George Washington and the cabinet and, and the nation as well, but more the people in government of the uh, wisdom of adopting a protective system protecting manufacturers, right. how important it was to protect your and develop your manufacturing base. Right. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, you're very welcome. No, no problem. Uh, so I was here, right? It is not difficult to account for this parental care. The mercantile interest was ably represented in the first Congress. It carried the elections pretty generally in the seaport towns and had made a judicious selection of candidates. Philadelphia was represented in the Senate by Robert Morris and in the House of Representatives by Thomas Fitzsimmons and George Clymer, three gentlemen of considerable talents and great influence. The representation in Congress was divided almost wholly between farmers, planters, and merchants. Manufacturing interest was, I believe, unrepresented, or if it had a few representatives, they were not distinguished men and had little or no influence. The tariff bears the most unequivocal marks of this state of things. 
Agriculture and commerce engrossed nearly the whole attention of Congress. Their interests were well guarded. Manufacturers, as may be seen on page 55, were abandoned to an unequal conflict with foreign rivalship, which consigned a large portion of them to ruin. Point five. In 1817, an act imposing $2 per ton on all foreign vessels arriving from ports to which American vessels are not allowed to trade. I have shown the revolting neglect with which the applications of the manufacturers were treated so highly discreditable to Congress. It now remains to contrast this procedure with the kind attention and fostering care bestowed on the merchants and the rapidity of motion on, in their concerns. On the 29th of July, 1816, the governor of Nova Scotia, by proclamation, announced the royal assent to an act of the legislature of that province, whereby the trade in plaster of Paris was intended to be secured to British or colonial vessels. To counteract this insidious measure, Mr. Rufus King, on the 17th of February, 1817, moved in the House of Representatives of the United States that the Committee on Foreign Relations be instructed to report such measures as they may judge necessary to regulate the importation of plaster of Paris and to countervail the regulations of any other nation injurious to our own relating to that trade. In four days afterwards, viz. on the 21st, Mr. Forsythe, chairman of that committee, reported a bill to regulate the trade in plaster of Paris, which was read the first and second time on that day and the third on the 3rd of March. The yeas and nays were called, and it was passed by a majority of 80 to 39. It was then sent to the Senate. There, read three times on the same day and passed with some amendments. Then returned to the House of Representatives, who concurred in the amendments and finally passed the bill. Thus, it was actually read four times, amended, and passed in one day, a case probably without example. It was only 14 days from its inception to its approbation by the president. Let it be observed further that the hostile measure which called forth the Spirited Act was only about seven months and a half in existence, when it was thus decisively counteracted. What a contrast between this celerity of operation and the lame policy observed towards manufacturers. The all-important act prohibiting the entry into our ports of British vessels, arriving from places from which American vessels are excluded, was reported and twice read in the Senate on the 1st of April, 1818. On the 4th, it was read the third time and passed. On the same day, it was read twice in the House of Representatives. On the 11th, it was read a third time and passed. On the 16th, it was presented to the President and approved by him on the 18th. Let any man, however hostile to manufacturers or manufacturers, compare the progress of these two bills involving such important principles, particularly the latter, with the snail's pace of any bill for the relief of manufacturers and he will be obliged to confess that Congress is actuated by a very different spirit towards the two different descriptions of citizens. Both acts are manly and dignified and worthy of the legislature of a great nation, determined to assert a reciprocity of advantage in its intercourse with foreign nations. The latter is an attempt to uproot the British Navigation Act in one of its most important features to which that nation is most devotedly attached. Considering its magnitude and importance, it may be just, justly doubted whether it was not too precipitately passed. It was only four days on its passage in the Senate and eight in the House of Representatives. Be this, however, as it may, my present object is only once more to place in contrast the paternal care of commerce and the frigid and withering indifference, not to say hostility, towards manufacturers displayed in that body which ought to look with equal eye upon and to dispense equal justice to all classes of citizens. And to close the catalog, a bill for the protection of commerce is now before Congress and not likely to meet with much opposition, 
which cannot fail to affect the agricultural interests severely by very materially abridging the markets for their productions. It is calculated to affect the object of the last mentioned act, which has failed to answer the purpose intended. More detail is unnecessary. The position is fully established that commerce has steadily enjoyed all the protection the government could afford. Every hostile movement on the part of foreign nations to the injury of our merchants has been decidedly met and counteracted. The consequence of this system has been to ensure our merchants. Number one, the whole of the coasting trade amounting to 400,000 tons per annum Number two, 86% of the tonnage engaged in the foreign trade. Viz, the total tonnage in the foreign trade for 22 years from 1796 to 1817, 18.2 18 million tons, of which there was American, 15.7 tons, and foreign, 2.4 million tons. And number three, an increase of tonnage unexampled in history of navigation and he goes through this chart showing the uh i don't want to say hyperbolic but quite a dramatic growth in um, the tonnage of the united states from 1789 to 1812 from 201,000 tons in 1789 to 1 1.2 million tons in 1812. Hmm. cool should I continue or anybody else like to read? Did Susie, uh, Susie still want to read? play back up. How's your connection tonight? I have to figure out how to make it bigger. Oh, oh. I'm, I'm fine, but uh, let's have Susie read and then anybody else. And then if nobody does, I would love to. Okay. Susie here, this, uh, this size. Susie, are you okay to read? I'm trying to figure out how to make it bigger. Are you, are you using your if phone? I send you a link that in the chat. Good. That helps? It's, it's pretty big on this now. No, I'm on my computer right now. I'm just trying to figure out how to get back to the full screen. I can read it if you want me to read it. I don't this. want to hold you guys. Yeah, sure. Uh, Helen, Helen, go for it. We haven't heard you in a while. There's three chapters. Yeah, you go on. I don't want to hold you guys. Okay. All right, Helen, okay. how, about, uh, how about you go for it? Sure. Erroneous views of the tariff. Protection of agricultural agriculture in 1789. Prostrate, prostrate state of the staples of South Carolina and Georgia. 90% on snuff and 100 on tobacco. Striking contrast. Abandonment of manufacturers. The farmers and planters of the United States are under strong impression Number one, that the tariff affords a decided protection to the manufacturers. Number two, that it operates as a heavy tax on the many for the benefit of the few. And number three, that there is no reciprocity in the case as agriculture is not protected. That the first position is radically erroneous is self-evident from the lamentable situation of so large a proportion of the manufacturers and manufacturers of the United States, on which I have already sufficiently discanted. The second is disproved in the 11th chapter. To the discussion of the third, I devote the present one. I have to scroll, I can't see. Uh, just to be clear, that's that there is um, no reciprocity in, in the case as agriculture is not protected. Okay, so that's why they feel like they're getting shafted. Okay, are you? Oh, okay, there you are, right. There are not many of the productions of agriculture which require protection as there are few of them that are imported. Let, They're me, both let me just uh, interrupt one sec, just to point out that most things that were grown back then, like food, for example, it couldn't really be shipped from Europe to America because it took, you know, six weeks, eight weeks to get over here. The food would have spoiled by then. So what were the agricultural products that could Not be spoiled. imported or exported tobacco cotton, cotton. things like that right mm. mm -hmm. they're, they're bulk in general and the concept was it go ahead 
I was just going to say, so protection for them is not needed because because they don't face competition safe. Yeah. Like the lettuce growers in uh, Massachusetts don't face competition from the lettuce growers in uh, England, you know? Right. Their bulk in general and the consequent expense of freight afford them tolerable security, but such as are imported or likely to be have been subject to high duties from the commencement of the government to the present time. The products of the earth imported into the United States do not much extend beyond hemp, cotton, malt, tobacco, cheese, indigo, coals, and potatoes, which by the tariff of 1789 were subject to the following duties. Um, Hemp, 60 cents, malt per bushel, 10, coals, whatever DO is, two. Um, Cheese per pound, four, manufactured tobacco. What's DO? I don't know, and I can't remember CWT, but I remember Paul said it last week. Uh, something weight. Okay. CWT is a hundred weight. Hundred weight. Oh. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. But it's DO has got me beat. DO, yeah. I, I don't ever remember seeing that before in relation to coal. Hmm. And, and it's also for cotton and indigo, if you see that there too. Yeah. Not for pound ten cents indigo DO sixteen cotton DO three potatoes percent. Five um, potatoes percent. Five. What's that mean? Percent per hundred, maybe. Per per hundred, yeah. That's got to be it. Five cents for a hundred potatoes. Good golly. Okay. The duty on cheese was equal to fifty-seven percent on indigo, about sixteen on snuff to nine nine ninety. On tobacco, 100. On coals, about 15%. The duty on the raw materials, hemp and cotton, demand particular attention. They were about 12%. Imposed in compliance with the suggestions of Mr. Burke to aid the agriculturalists of South Carolina and Georgia because they hoped to be able to raise those articles. South Carolina and Georgia at that period were at a very low ebb. Their great staples, rice and indigo, had greatly sunk in price, and they had not yet entered on the co- culture of cotton. Um, who is that? And, and what is that? Ed Danis, Ed Dennis Burke, in a debate on the tariff of the 16th April 1789 to induce the House to lay considerable duty on hemp and cotton, gave a melancholy picture of the situation of those states. The staples, the staple products of South Carolina and Georgia, he observed, were hardly worth cultivation on account of their fall in price. The lands were certainly well adapted to the growth of hemp, and he had no doubt, but its culture would be practiced with attention. The cotton was likewise in contemplation among them, and if good seed could be procured, he hoped might succeed. But the low, strong rice lands would produce hemp in abundance, many thousands of tons even this year, if it was not so late in season. In a debate on the same subject, Mr. Tucker, another of the representatives from that state, re-echoed the plaintive strains of his colleague. The situation of South Carolina was melancholy. While the inhabitants were deeply in debt, the produce of the state was daily falling in price. Rice and indigo were become so low as to be considered by many not objects worth of worthy of cultivation. Gentlemen, he added, will consider that it is not an easy thing for a planter to change his whole system of husbandry in a moment, but accumulated burdens will drive to this and increase their embarrassments. The duty on manufactured tobacco was intended to operate as an absolute prohibition and was liberally proposed with this view by Mr. Sherman, a representative from Connecticut. 
Mr. Sherman moved six cents per pound on manufactured tobacco as he thought the duty ought to amount to a prohibition. While these high duties were imposed upon such of the pop, the pro, uh, such of the productions of the farmer and planter as were likely to be imported, all the great leading articles of manufacturers, as may be seen, were subject to only 5%. A striking contrast in the tariff for 1789. Snuff, 90. Tobacco, 100. Indigo, 16. Coals, 15. Cotton, 12. Hemp, 12. Woolens, 5. Cottons, 5. Pottery five, linen five, manufacturers of iron five, lead, copper, and five also. In the last chapter, I gave a sketch of the fostering care of commerce. Here we see in the very outset of the government the same care. Can't scroll. Extended to agriculture and an equal degree of neglect to manufacturers. The germ of that cruel and withering system which has, I repeated, placed this country nearly in the state of a colony to the manufacturing nations of Europe, which without expending a single cent for our protection, have enjoyed more benefits from our commerce than ever were enjoyed by the mother country during the colonial state of this continent, and more benefits than any nation ever enjoyed from colonies except Spain. Perhaps even this exception is super superfluous in 1790 say that again superfluous superfluous there you go thank you in 1790 the tariff was altered when indigo was raised to 25 cents per pound and coals to three cents per bushel in 1792 it was again altered and hemp raised to 20 dollars per pound and coals to four and a half cents per bushel this was about 20% on hemp and 25 on coals, whereas the leading manufacturers of cotton, wool, leather, steel, brass, iron, and copper were only raised to 7.5%. Passing over the intermediate alterations of the tariff, which all bear the same stamp, I shall notice the protection afforded at present to those agricultural articles usually imported. You have to scroll. Um, hamper town, well, uh, hemp, hamper town, hamper ton. <laughs> um, uh, price was it 114, rate of duty 30, duty percent 26, cotton 30, cheese in Holland 90. Is that 90 percent? Is that 90 percent? Is that what that is? The duty is percent. We're not that I'm reading in the last column, 90%. Yep, yeah, that's, that's correct. That's yep. Quite high. That's huge. Yeah. Wow. Almost, almost doubles shirt. the price of a, a slab of cheese. Almost mm -hmm. doubles. And there are two there that do. Manufactured tobacco, tobacco in Geneva per gallon, whatever Geneva is, a fuel of some sort, I presume. Uh, maybe Switzerland? Oh, well, oh. Per gallon. Yeah, where, wherever it comes from. But, but, yeah, but the duty know. is 100%. 100 you know, that, that's luxury pricing, luxury goods probably. Round some sort of old word for yeah. gin, maybe? I'm not sure. Yeah, could be a, a drink. Yeah. All the other productions of agriculture are subject to 15% duty, which, be it observed, is the same as on more than half of the manufacturers imported into this country. We find the staple article of South Carolina and Georgia, of which the freight is about 30%, secured by 30% duty, the staple of Virginia by 75 and 100, and the peach brandy and whiskey of the farmers generally by 68 and 100, while the cotton and woolen branches are exposed to destruction and have been in a great measure destroyed for want of a duty of 45 and 50 percent. To display the monstrous parti partiality of this produce procedure, rather, I shall contrast the duty and freight of a few articles of both descriptions. 
So here's sure. some agricultural products versus manufactured products. Okay, oh. so hemp. Right. Yeah. Oh, so so like, do so you want me to just read the whole thing then? Hemp. Um, you don't have to read every single column. I don't think. Okay. But you can you can see how much higher it is the the total the column that says total mm -hmm. for both sides it goes from you know fifty to one hundred and ten percent for the agricultural products. Uh, sorry, there's sugar at forty three. And then the highest for the manufactured is 28, going from, you know, 17 to 22 to 28 in that range. So in the cotton, okay, well, the total is 60. Okay, so that means that our cotton goes to them and they import, well, I mean, like, if we're... No, 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 imported, import, imported, imported uh, cotton, like okay. raw cotton. Okay, and that's... We would have us. a 60% tariff on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the in terms of those costs, in, in terms yeah. of those costs on that graph, the first thing to me that's really noticeable is the difference in freight per uh, hundredweight or per container. Oh. You know, the manufactured stuff is sorry. The uh, yeah, the manufactured is one two, and look at all of the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so agricultural so sector. So look at the cost. I mean, just, just on the question, you know, I mean, my mind immediately, I can't help it. I just, you know, go straight away to, wow, that's way more efficient, isn't it? Why are you penalising these industries? Mm -hmm. it, yeah. I'll just continue anyway, on. It, it just, is hard. Just a, a simple economic observation on my part, that's all. Thank you. That's good. Yeah. It is hardly possible to conceive of a more revolting arrangement or one that more completely violates the holy, the golden rule, all things whatsoever you would, that men should do to you, you do you even so to them. Now in the face of this nation, I venture to ask, is there a respectable man in society who considers the above items and will not allow that the protection of the agriculture is incomparable to get incomparably more complete than of manufacturers. And yet wonderful to tell the extravagant protection bestowed on the manufacturers and the want of protection to agriculturists, the insatiable appetite of the former and the liberality and disinterestedness of the latter are preached in long winded speeches in and memorials to Congress and as long-winded newspaper essays and are received as sacred and undeniable. And you need to scroll. Okay, another contrast. Potatoes, 15 um, for the duty. Uh, let's see here. Butter, 15. Flour, malt, onions, tobacco, and leaf, 15. Watches, 7.5%. Jewelry, 75 Ink powder, 15. Printed books, 15. Worsted shoes, 15. Linens and silks, 15. Potatoes and tobacco, linen, silks, and printed books subjected, subject to the same duty. What wonderful... Okay, so, I'm sorry. At ahead, this time, was it ignorance or was this on purpose? Purpose. No. <laughs> Well, it was it was the political clout of this class versus you know the relatively insignificant political clout of the manufacturing class. Because mm -hmm. it so, looks like our own manufacturing is actually being discouraged, yes. and they want us buying the imports instead. Yes. That's what this looks like. That was the uh, the philosophy of of Adam Smith and and of the free traders generally of course they <sighs> loved the tariff being applied to their own agricultural products of course um but uh we're happy to pull out the free trader argument whenever the idea of uh tariffs on manufactured goods was was raised thank you you guys for doing so much to re-educate us Mm, thanks for being here.
Potatoes and tobacco, linen, silks, and printed books subject to the same duty. What wonderful talents this tariff displays. How admirable it corroborates the fond daydreams in which we indulge ourselves of our immense superiority over the benighted Europeans who mirror uh, who Mirabal Dictu, according to Judge Story, are studying lessons of political economy under Congress. The statesmen of the old world, in admiration of the success of our policy, are relaxing the rigor of their own systems. So says the celebrated Salem Memorial, edited according to public fame by this learned judge. Objections have been made to the classification of manufactured tobacco and snuff among the articles dutied for the benefit of agriculture as they fall under the denomination of manufacturers. They are, it is true, manufacturers, but that they are so extravagantly taxed is not from any particular, any, any, part, any partiality towards the manufacturers of them, but to protect the planters. It requires no moderate share of modesty to assert and of credulity, credulity, what, what is that word, Paul? Credulity. Credulity, well, well, thank you, to believe that regard of the manufacturers leads to lay a duty of 100% of manufactured tobacco when for five years, the manufacturers of woolens and cottons have in vain implored to have the duty on superfine cloth muslins and cambrics raised beyond 25%. Even the Jew of Pello, capacious as was his gullet, would not be able to swallow this fiction. I wish it distinctly understood that as the prices of hemp, Geneva, rum, coals, etc., are subject to frequent fluctuations in foreign markets, I do not pretend to vouch for the critical exactness at the present time of the preceding quotations. I have collected my information from merchants of character <coughs> on whom reliance may be placed and have every reason to believe that it is substantially correct. After school. Okay, it's the last chapter. You want me to continue reading, or does somebody else want to read? So there's there's actually two chapters left, but this chapter is only three pages long. There's okay. uh, fifteen pages left in total. Okay. An awful contrast: distress in Br in Great Britain because she cannot engross the supply of the world. Distressing the United States because the home market is inundated with rival manufacturers. This shall be a short chapter, but I hope it will make a deep and lasting impression. The subject is of vital importance. I have drawn several contrasts between our policy and that of foreign nations to evince the unsoundness and pernicious consequences of the former. To one more, I request attention. Great distress pervades the manufacturing districts of Great Britain in which commerce largely partakes. And whence does it arise? Because her merchants and manufacturers cannot engross the supply of the world for, th for their capacity of producing every article made by machinery is commensurate with the wants of the whole human race and could they find a passage to the moon and open a market there, they would be able to inundate it with their fabrics. Their government with a fostering and did somebody say something? Okay. Their government go oh, go ahead, Paul. I was just saying I love that little uh, uh, metaphor there. <laughs> <laughs> Find a passage to the moon and open a market there. They'd be able to inundate it with their fabrics. I just love it. You know. I know. I couldn't help but crack up. Their government, with the fostering and paternal care, which by the contrast reflects discredit 
discredit our discredit on ours secures them the unlimited range of the domestic market the and losses no and loses no opportunity by bounties drawbacks and every other means which can be devised to aid them in their efforts to engross our and all our other markets but the wisdom of the other nations of europe guarding the industry of their subjects excludes them from various markets which they were wont to supply and baffles their skill and sagacity the great mass of their surplus productions is therefore disgorged on us to the destruction of our manufacturers and the impoverishment of the nation what a lamentable contrast we exhibit our manufacturers suffer equally their capital is moldering away their establishments falling into ruins themselves threatened with bankruptcy and their wives and children with dependents their workmen dispersed and driven to servile labor and mendacity and why not because they are excluded from foreign markets they aspire to none their distress arises from being debarred of their home market to which their to which our mistaken policy invites all the manufacturers of the earth thus while the british government uses all its energies to enable the manufacturers of that nation to monopolize the markets of the united states our government looks on with perfect indifference while the ill-fated depressed and vilified american defeated in the unequal struggle with power rivals and an energetic government is bankrupted or beggared or in danger of bankruptcy or beggary and in vain invokes its protection in a word the representatives of the freest people on the globe have less regard for and pay less attention to the happiness of their fellow citizens than the monarchs of the old world to their subjects our citizens Man, this could be written today yeah, it's pretty great eh? oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> our citizens merely seek a portion of that protection which the most despotic monarchs in europe afford their subjects but they seek in vain Pharaoh did not turn a more deaf ear to the applications of the Israelites than Congress have for 5 years to those of their fellow citizens who have contributed to elevate them to the honorable stations they occupy and who pay their proportion for services from the benefit of which they are in a great measure precluded what a hideous what a Oh okay what a hideous what a deplorable contrast what a libel on republican government what a triumph for the friends of monarchy for those who hold the appalling heresy to which our career affords some countenance that man was made was not made for self government this is so shocking a state of things that with all the evidence of the facts before my eyes i can scarcely allow myself to credit it would to god it were not true but alas it is a most afflicting reality sharp little wrong word very sharp little chapter mm -hmm. okay who's up for reading <laughs> okay no. i will try it okay Thank you. Encouragement and patronage, patronage of immigrants by England and France. Advantages of the United States. Great numbers of immigrants. Their sufferings. Return of many of them. Interesting table. Some political economists have asserted that the strength of a nation consists in the number of its inhabitants. This, without qualification, is manifestly erroneous. A numerous population in a state of wretchedness is rather a symptom of debility than of strength. Such a such a population is ripe for treason and spoil. 
but a dense population usefully and profitably employed and in a state of comfort and prosperity constitutes the pride and glory of a statesman and is the basis of the power and security of nations. Hence, there is scarcely any object which the most profound statesmen and monarchs of Europe have for ages more uniformly pursued than the encouragement of immigrants possessed of useful talents. Under all the governments of Europe, therefore, even the most despotic inducements have been frequently held out to invite a tide of population of this description. I need to read that again. Under all the, whoa, under all the governments of Europe, therefore, even the most despotic inducements have been frequently held out to invite a tide of population of this description. And the wealth, power, and prosperity of some of the first-rate nations date their commencement from migrations thus promoted and encouraged. The decay and decrepitude of the nations from which the immigrants have removed have been coeval and preceded peri passu with the prosperity of those to which they have migrated. The woolen manufacture, the great source of the wealth and prosperity of England, owes its introduction there to the wise policy of Edward III, who invited over Flemish workmen and accorded them most important privileges. The horrible persecutions of de Alva in the Netherlands and the repeal of the Edict of Nantes in France at a more recent period drove thousands of artists of every kind, possessed of great wealth and inestimable talents, to England, whence she derived incalculable advantages. Hmm. Spain, whose policy we despise, repeatedly encouraged settlements of immigrants to establish useful manufactures, which had a temporary success. But the radical unsoundness of her system and her spirit of persecution blasted all these promising attempts. France, under Louis XIV, pursued this system to a greater extent than any other nation. That king gave titles of nobility, pensions, and immunities to various artists and manufacturers who introduced new branches of industry into his dominions and a great portion of the wealth which he squandered in the splendor of his court and the ambitious projects of his reign arose from his protection of those immigrants and the manufacturers they introduced. If this policy was wise and had the sanction of the statesmen of nations of which the population was comparatively dense, how much more forcibly does it apply to countries like the United States and Russia of which the population bears so small a proportion to the territory. No country affords more room for immigrants. None would derive more benefit from them. None could hold out so many solid and substantial inducements, and there is none to which the eyes and longings of that active and energetic class of men who are disposed to seek foreign climes for the purpose of improving their condition are more steadily directed. We have the most valuable staples, the greatest variety of soil, climate, and productions, an almost unlimited extent of territory, and the most slender population in proportion to that territory of any nation in the world, except the Indians and perhaps the wandering Tartars. And had manufacturers, particularly the cotton, woolen, and iron, instead of the paltry duty of 5%, been early and decisively taken under the protection of the government at its first organization, after the example of other nations, there is no doubt but we should have had a tide of immigration beyond any that the world has ever witnessed. From the oppression and misery that prevail in various parts of Europe, from the high idea entertained of the advantages of our form of government, and from a variety of other circumstances, 
it is fair to presume that had immigrants been able at once to find employment at the occupations to which they were brought up, we might have had an annual accession of 30 or 40,000 beyond the numbers that have settled among us, but I shall only suppose 20,000. To events what might have been from what has taken place, I annex the only two tables of immigration I have been able to find, and let it be observed that the first is necessarily very imperfect, as there was no governmental regulation to enforce the collection of accurate statements. In 1817, 22,240 immigrants arrived in 10 ports. In Boston, 2,300, New York, 7,634, Perth Amboy, 637, Philadelphia, 7,085, Wilmington, 558, in Baltimore, 1,817, Norfolk, Just do the totals for things like this in general. Okay, so we got a total of 18,000 and a total of 22,000. In New York from March 3rd, 1818 to December 11th, 1819, the numbers reported at the mayor's office were 18,929. The mayor of New York has given a... calculation that these were but two-thirds of the whole number that arrived. Admitting this estimate, the whole number in 21 months was about 28,000 or 16,000 per annum. 20,000, which I have assumed as what might have been annually added to our population by a sound policy on the subject of manufactures, will be regarded as probable on a consideration of the preceding tables particularly that of the enormous arrivals in New York, notwithstanding a variety of discouraging circumstances of which the tendency was to repress or even to destroy the spirit of immigration. Among these, the principal one has been the calamities and wretchedness endured by most of these immigrants, whose fond hopes and expectations were wholly blasted on their arrival here. Thousands and tens of thousands of artists, mechanics, and manufacturers with talents beyond price, and many of them with handsome capitals, escaped from misery and oppression in Europe and fled to our shores as a land of promise where they expected to find room for the exercise of their industry and talents. But the fond delusion was soon dispelled. As soon as they arrived, they sought employment at their usual occupations, none was to be found. Those whose whole fortune was their industry wandered through our streets in search even of menial employments to support a wretched existence. And numerous instances have occurred of cotton weavers and clothiers, as well as persons of other useful branches who have sawed and piled wood in our cities and some of whom have broken stones on our turnpikes for little more than a bare subsistence. Many hundreds have returned home, heartbroken, and lamenting their folly after having exhausted all their funds in the double voyage and their inevitable expenses. Their misfortunes operate as a beacon to their countrymen to shun the rocks on which they have been shipwrecked. It is easy to estimate the effect the effects that must have been produced by the dismal tales in the letters written by those who remained and the verbal accounts of those who returned. It is not extravagant to suppose that every returned immigrant prevented the immigration of 20 persons disposed to seek an asylum here. And the melancholy letters transmitted by those who had no means of returning must have had nearly equal influence. Many of those who were unable to return, rendered desperate by distress and misery, have proved injurious to the country, to which they might have produced the most eminent advantages. 
I hazard an estimate of the gain that might have been made by a sound policy, which would have encouraged manufacturing industry and promoted immigration to the extent I have assumed, viz. $20,000 20, additional per annum since the commencement of our present form of government. I will suppose the value of the productive labor of each individual to be only a quarter of a dollar per day beyond his subsistence, which for 20,000 would have amounted to, is that 1,500,000 per annum? Mm -hmm. The whole number that would have arrived in the 30 years would have been 600,000. The annexed table exhibits a result which petrifies with astonishment and sheds a new and strong stream of light on the impolicy of our system. This is if things had been done competently and, in, and if manufacturing and productive employment had been encouraged, then these people with talent coming in from Europe, instead of just falling into squalor and leaving broken, would have been able to generate a lot more free energy and he's just saying well we'll estimate what is it like per uh, per worker a quarter of a dollar of profit i guess back to the state or whatever else beyond their their overhead costs of maintaining their their personal lives and we could just like play out the scenario of what wealth we could have created in those first few years and it's a uh, huge numbers this right is heartbreaking 697 million dollars in uh 1820 dollars that's uh you know you don't hear this in in any kind of history at least i never did no mm. Mm. i mean this is again what would have ha could have happened had competence prevailed instead of what did happen well it just makes me think of that you know writing on the statue of liberty hmm Mm -hmm. And I don't even remember at the moment when it was put there, but for a lot of people, that seemed like a cruel joke. Give me your poor, your tired, your hungry, whatever that is. Whew. Yeah. Hey, it's, the it's, natural it's, increase. Oh. Later. No, I'll, I'll chime in with thought later on after you finish. You're almost done. The natural increase of the immigrants by generation at 5% per annum would make the number amount to 1,288,000. Of the addition, I take no account. I barely mention that an immigration of 10,000 annually would, according to this increase, have produced the same result as the assumed number, 20,000. Let us then state the results of different numbers. The labor of 10,000 with the natural increase of 5% per annum at a quarter of a dollar per day would produce in 30 years, ooh, almost 700 million. That of 1,000 with the same increase, 350 million. It is fair to suppose that the article produced, articles produced by them would be worth double the labor, or in the first case, is that 1 billion? No, uh, $1.395 billion. In the second, 700 million. These immense advantages we blindly threw away while we were scuffling through the world at every point of the compass and in every bay, cove, creek, and inlet to which we had access for a precarious commerce, which ruined the great mass of the merchants who pursued it, exposed our hardy seamen to stripes and bondage, involved us in unnecessary collisions with the belligerent powers, and finally in war, and entailed on us a host of foreign ministers. A wasting Navy that will cost above three and a half million dollars this year, and a debt of nearly 80 million. No, is that 80? No, it's 80 million of dollars. Other views of the subject present themselves. Although a large proportion of the immigrants who arrive in this and other countries are dependent on their labor for support, yet many capitalists immigrate, and there would be double the number could they employ their capitals advantageously. 
I will assume an average of $150 for each immigrant in money and property. This would amount in the whole to $3 million per annum or in the whole 30 years to $90 million of dollars. The consumption of the productions of agriculture by those immigrants, according to the calculation in page 158, at the rate of a quarter of a dollar per day, would be at present per annum $54 million of dollars, their, and their clothing at $40 per annum, $24 million. Calculations have been made of the value to a state of an active, efficient individual. In England, it was formerly, I believe, supposed to be about 100 pounds sterling. Mm -hmm. I will suppose each immigrant to be worth $300. This would make the amount of the 600,000 immigrants assumed above 180 million. These calculations are all necessarily crude and admit of considerable drawbacks. But whatever may be the drawbacks, sufficient will remain to prove to the world that there probably never was a nation which had so many advantages within its grasp and never a nation that so wantonly threw its advantages away. Whew. Suppose 10,000 immigrants annually with the natural increase of 5% amount of labor in 30 years... 700 million value of their productions 1 billion amount of property imported 90 million 90, present oh, annual 90 million, consumption yeah, right. 80 million as this chapter drew to a close i met with a report made to the house of representatives of the united states on the subject of immigrants which deserves some notice an application was made to Congress by a body of Swiss for a quantity of land on more advantageous terms than those on which they are sold by law. The committee, after stating the necessity of lessening the existing indulgences in the sale of the public lands, add, if the public interests should ever justify a relaxation from them, it would be in favor of American citizens and recommend to the house the following resolution resolved that the prayer of the petitioners ought not to be granted. So far there is reason and propriety in the report. The terms on which lands are sold by the United States are sufficiently favorable for foreigners as well as natives. But when the committee notice the depressed situation of American manufacturers and assign it as a reason against encouraging the immigration of such a useful body of men possessed of invaluable talents. It is a full proof that they did not study the subject profoundly. In answer to that part of the petition, which declares that one of the principal objects is the domestic manufacture of cotton, wool, flax, and silk, the committee will only say that it may be well considered how far it would comport with sound policy to give a premium for the introduction of manufacturers at the moment when by the almost unanimous declaration of our manufacturers, it is said they cannot live without further protection. A more obvious idea would have been to have suggested such encouragement of manufacturers as would have relieved our citizens actually engaged in those branches and held out due inducements for accessions to our population of the sterling character of the applicants in question. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you. Yeah, it reminds me really, uh, whenever you, if you ever talk to taxi drivers um, and ask them what they did when they came here or what they did before they arrived here from like Egypt or Libya or a variety of other places, you'll tend to find chemical engineers and nuclear scientists and doctors and, and incredibly 
competent, trained people who could offer so much value, except they, they have to drive taxis or deliver food when they get here, or drive Ubers, because they're told when they upon arrival that they have to redo their entire education according to Quebec or Canadian standards, which they can't do because they have kids usually to feed. So, you know, we're wasting all of this talent, you know, because we, we have nowhere to put them to work. We're not building anything. So we can't really use most of these people to do much either. So it's, it's very, very <laughs> similar to what, what he's talking to 200 years ago. So it's still and, going and, on, what you're saying. In, in, in or, Ukraine, they, 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 the taxi drivers are, have like ma master's degrees, some of them, before the war, you know. An even more extreme example of a country that is not um, responsibly developing its manufacturing base. That didn't, I mean, because of the uh, talk or crafts. The mother just uh, pointed out to the chat. Personal experience. Yeah. My, my mother and grandmother just wrote uh, that my great grandmother faced the same issue when she was a dentist and came here to Canada in '53 and couldn't practice. Yeah, mm -hmm. forgot about that. Wow, what's that, Paul? I have a first first hand anecdote. Back in the '70s, I was a taxi driver. Uh, you know, <laughs> taxi driving uh, funded my student days, and uh, I remember distinctly meeting an Italian gentleman like that who was probably late thirties, somewhere around about there. And just one of the most erudite passengers I'd had, you know, as a taxi driver. And it turns out that was exactly his experience as a migrant coming over after the Second World War in the first phase of migrants coming to Australia. He was a chemical engineer or something along those lines, but couldn't get work here and needed to work, get a job of any kind so that he could then assist in the immigration of family members. And when I met him in this, this happened for him, I think, in the 50s. When I met him in the 70s, he was sponsoring the last granddaughter, and at which point he was then free to pursue what interests he had. So he'd kind of sacrificed 20 years of his life. Mm. That puts Very a touching, lot into uh, perspective. And, you know, yeah, I, it, it was a really interesting experience and a good one for me at the time, that's for sure. Yeah. And uh, it's just it's just remarkable how um, w in our education system in America, um, you know, when they talked about the country, they always they never talked about the actual um, economic issues that were going on and the, the really the battle between the colonial economic system and the and the system that is designed to develop American manufacturing and protect the and and the the people and. Uh, develop uh, powerful communities. Mm. And I'm sure it's, it was that way. I don't know what it was like in Canada, but I'm sure that American textbooks, oh my God, all they talked about was just, it was just glossed over the subject, which you're covering here. Well, it's amazing because, I mean, when I went to school, we were still saying the Pledge of Allegiance every morning at the start of class. And, you know, America the home of the free, the land of the brave. And it's just amazing how much we were not taught about how this system is supposed to work, how it right. originally was created. Yeah. I had no idea we were already being so dumbed down. Mm -hmm. I knew we were being dumbed down. I just didn't I knew know. too. I just don't know why, you know? I didn't know how. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that, the, the breadth of that one, just how many versions of how there is, has been, you know, the revelation for me over the last decade. Mm -hmm. Just how many ways, you know, the, the uh, directedness of the powers that be um, can and have been over the last decade or had that become very apparent to me it's been a real big learning curve and the de demarcation in policy that determines the course of people's lives yeah mm. Mm. I remember talking about free trade with my family around the dinner table when all that came into effect and tried just trying to strike up a conversation and the whole family just they give me that 
that blank stare. Yes. <laughs> and and that's the end of the conversation. And like that kind of set my the way my life went. It's like I, there's nobody to talk to about what I thought was a problem, but obviously no one else was, uh, everyone w- was indifferent to that for some reason. You know, we're losing our, well, here we had like, what I first thing I noticed was the grape juice. Uh, we stopped manufacturing grape juice, and it, it's a little thing, but and the next thing you know, the factories moved out, and the car manufacturers, and and then and now it's all China's fault. Like I don't get it. Well, I did notice an attitude because my my family my family were, were actually educators. Um, my mom was a librarian, but we lived like really from they were raised in from Great Depression times, so they were very very frugal about everything. And we would take the grape juice and add more water to it, that kind of a thing. <laughs> I mean, even though we could afford it, you know. <laughs> and so I noticed that there were people who were. Um, <clears throat> Uh, of a different mindset they really bought into the uh, it's almost like a, a way we were poor and we um, it, or acted poor and we knew we knew what it was like to suffer more and there were other people they just were like living the american dream as if it was a, in a dream you know and so i had a sense of that uh of um that something wasn't right with the with the economic policies of the united states I didn't know that we were exploiting a lot of countries and and really creating a fiat currency and things. But I knew that there was something not right about almost the attitudes of the community and people. Mm. Most people didn't even know they they weren't even it wasn't even on the radar. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and you know it's tragic that it has to become on the radar in a sense because people are should be enjoying life and going skiing and you know just having a good time and stuff they don't need to have to um wake up to this illusion in america yeah. i i i disagree with the comment that it's tragic sure. and and that it okay. is unfair that we have to wake up to the illusion i think okay. that it <laughs> Well, I, I'm not trying to pick on anybody or call anyone down. That's not the issue. I, th- I think the issue is that this group, these different faces I see on my iPad, are, are coming together to discuss the things that have brought us to where we are and where we might go from here. And so okay. that issue that is tragic that we've come to the place that we're in um, that tragedy is only the responsibility for that tragedy is only placed upon our fathers, our mothers, and on our heads, and that's that's okay. Like I'm not blaming anyone. It it, it, it is the reality that we find ourselves in, and so why are we taking this time to sit down together across countries and talk about these things? Because each each of you and I care about what is being presented from this this story, from this presentation from, you know, 200 plus years ago about what was happening in uh, the American frontier uh, in regard to the international, um, well, more specific than the international, to, to, to the, the colonialists, to the British Empire, to the, what I said quite a while ago about Sam commenting on the they, um, what they are trying to do. And so, yes, it, it, if we choose to wake up and we choose to um, take responsibility and see what's going on and then try to impart some kind of energetic expression, try to impart some kind of, kind of direction as to what our community and what our people can move forward to in this consciousness, the consciousness of truth. What we're mining for here, at least what I'm mining for, is not a story about what happened in the past. What I'm mining for is what happened then, which brought us to now, and then how that educates us to what is happening now, Mm -hmm. so that I and anyone else can actually go, okay, uh, what are we going to do about this? Are we going to do anything about this? And the plutocrats, 
that are uh, pulling the strings of the marionette, um, whether it be Trudeau or Biden or, or Macron or, or anyone, um, that we can, we can stand up to say, well, actually, we see, we see the strings, first of all, and we see why and how this is happening. And we, as each man and woman, stand in a voice to say, this is where we're going to go. This is what I'm going yep. to energetically cause to happen. And yep. let's do it. Like, it, this isn't some magical, oh, we're going to do this, you know, vote for this or, or make this uh, 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 new political party or, or whatever. I mean, it may come to that. But this, um, this energetic emission, ignition, the starting point of the, the people who are not, like, we're not members of some, uh, you know, big council, international council that's determining the outcome of, of economic policy for all the different countries of the world for the next decade or two or whatever. That, that's not what I see this group or this, this enterprise as, but it is that ignition point of, or potentially is that ignition point of each such and one, each each of us going into our community to bring forth a, a consciousness and, a, and and an awareness of what has been done in the past that affected the actual boots on the ground lives of each owner of a manufacturing plant, each employee who's standing at a a, 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 a mill or, or, a, or a, a lathe or, or whatever ma manufacturing something that they have or now they don't have a job because of these economic policies that are what uh, just like made up proclamations from some super group from some oh well we're going to do this over here in America and we're going to do this over here in India and we're going to do this over here in Canada or whatever region or, or, or area um, Going back I, to the point, go ahead, I think, please. Oh, yeah. I think Nathan just meant that if we had um, aristocratic leaders in society, then we could enjoy skiing. But but Arlen's point is so important. And I've been thinking about this, about, you know, this very thing that he's talking about being becoming more responsible. So it, it resonates. I mean, it means a lot to me. What he's saying is really, really important for me, too. Thank and you. It's really thank wild you for saying when, that. I'm sorry. <clears throat> no, it's I was really just thanking when... <laughs> sorry, sorry, Go ahead. Go ahead, Susie. When we get to have the presentations that bring into focus some of the metaphysical aspects of our reality or whatever, we truly are raising the consciousness of the entire planet having these discussions and on a natural level we are re-educating ourselves to where we simply are not going to tolerate these people and their sophistry and allow them to maneuver themselves into positions of power on the next go-round mm -hmm. we now understand nationalism is not a dirty word protectionism them is not a dirty word mm -hmm. these are very important components to build your own society and then each society each country can come together in win-win cooperation from a safe base that they have built for themselves and that's Nerd. where we're going no Nerd. more of these dirty word too plutocrats or whatever you want to call them no more. Be, no be, more. Susie, be Susie, be careful with the They'll commentary. Be, sorry. Sorry, was that our Go Arlen? Ahead, I'm okay, sorry. Carry on. Okay. So Susie, be careful about the commentary. Uh, I mean, whatever voice I have. Be careful about the commentary about the safe space. What I mean by that is the <laughs> the history of men and women who have changed the world has not been from a place of safety. It has mm -hmm. quite the opposite been from a place of risk. 
where there there is change that is made for the betterment of a society, for a betterment of a people, betterment for the whole world, but that a change to what is will cause a ripple of 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 conflict and potential danger and those think of jfk 1960 i should know my american history better but 62 63 whatever year it was comes to change the world and there's risk and so the safety i i think um i'm, I'm trying to remember the quote i actually had it printed on my fridge years ago and it was from a rather uh questionable president of the of the early 1900s of the U.S., but it has to do with the fact of if you put safety and something else first, then you will lose freedom and you will lose the potential for that change, for that beneficial, the, the benefit that comes from changing the system as it is, but right. that incurs risk. And so we stand responsible for the risk and we stand with our necks on the block where mm -hmm. okay i'm going to stand for this and yes i believe in this change mm -hmm. and bad things could happen or i could suffer or i could lose my head yeah. if, if if we do this yeah no i mean we take for granted we the level of sacrifice that risk and stand up mm -hmm. right what, what we do, oops. No, it's okay, mm -hmm. Susie. Go for it. Well, we are creating a more secure environment for our children, are we not? No. No, we're not. We're not because I actually just heard, I, I think it was Anthony uh, on the, the Mel K uh, 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 podcast, and, and I'm not certain of it is i listened to a few of them today so I, I don't recall which one it was specifically but it actually was the notion that to create actually it wasn't him it was another one to create safety if, if our goal as parents is to create a safe world for the future of our <laughs> children yeah that we we actually limit the potential of their growth we limit that it could be a better world a different world because we're not willing to take risk. We're not willing to risk even our children's lives. And that sounds horrible, but- it, Well, think it about it when you were little. We, we, we could do all kinds of things you can't do now. Mm -hmm. what, what? I said, think about society. I know when I was little, we could do all kinds of things that you can't do now. Kids can't do anything. Arlen, Arlen's now. talking about something even more high risk. Oh. Uh, but it's true. It's okay. true. Well, it's yeah, true. No, I know that, but I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> macro, micro, whatever. <laughs> it was a better world, no, man, that's for sure. It, 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 it's all true. But but the thing is that if safety is your goal, if, if, if um, security and me not losing my head, if, if the goal is I will do the things that will, will have the outcome, that I will not lose my head, that I will not be sacrificed, whatever. That puts a limit on the potential, and it very much can be used against you to where, well, we'll just threaten you with this or we'll threaten you with that, and then you'll conform, you'll comply, and so then an, an other's goal or an ulterior motive is, is realized that isn't for the benefit of, of you, or your children, or even your future, or your children's future safety. And so the, the, the ideals of what one believes in, about what one holds to be true, they, they can't be put down. You, 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 I can't speak for anyone else. So you do you, but I will risk my life and I will risk my children's lives. My children all grow, are, are all grown now. But for the future potential, these, these people in, 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 not these people, what Carrie is writing about is trying to make a better world, trying right. to make a situation by which the economies balance and, and equate to a, uh, an increase, an increase in 
well-being and a, and an increase in in um, st st standard of living. That's what I tried right. to say earlier, and I I lost it. That increase so, is what I was talking about when I used those terms. You know, the idea of promoting the general welfare for ourselves and our yes. posterity. Those well, were the well, ideas well, that I was yes. talking about. But the season that we are in, we very much need to embrace the risk that you are talking about. And I think I do need to do some reflection and kind of get rid of a little bit of my need for safety. So thank you. <laughs> well, I have a question and, and, about and tariffs. Um, like uh, mo most, a lot of this, um, uh, what we read was he, he's talking about terror, like putting tariffs on products and things like that. Um, maybe I missed something. Um, I wasn't here for all the sessions. Was are there other, any other tools that they that the government used besides tariffs to um, to help and foster um, a growth in their countries? Um, I would mention one straight off the top there, and uh, I mentioned it earlier kind of thing. Anywhere there was a port, anytime you've got shipping moving in and out of the port, not only do you have tariffs on whatever they have within within them, but you also have the port charges, the service charges of, you know, tying them up, unloading them, all of that. Uh, you know, there's a certain amount of duties, I think, that were levied uh, on uh, that kind of um, financial stream. In a way, though, that's sort of like a tariff, I guess. More directly to Kelly's the question, though, that, uh, no, there was, Hamilton did enumerate several different uh, possible avenues for um, encouraging manufacturing and uh, technological development in America. One of them was called a bounty, which was... Yeah, yeah, that that's right. Which was like... Um, government would say uh, we are seeking a new process to do this so government would determine that it's in the nation's best interest to find a way to do something and so they would offer a material bounty to whoever could first come and demonstrate that they had figured out how to do something like a prize or something like nuclear fusion today might be one the first person yeah. who can demonstrate a viable nuclear fusion reactor, which is operating above unity, it's generating power, would receive, you know, however many dollars. Uh, another one that was used was direct subsidy, was, um, you know, government helping to pay to develop certain industries like a steel industry or railroad industry um they would they would say we know how to do this but we need to um help encourage its uh, development and so we will actually pay what what we might call today state enterprises mm -hmm. but it was it wasn't exactly the same format because oftentimes it was still run by private citizens but it was just done there was help from, you know, the public purse. Okay. The yeah, entirety of the Australian, Australian railway system uh, in the uh, latter part of the 19th century, early part of the 20th century, was all financed by state governments. Yeah, the first private railways private, in the private United private States... States didn't enter into it. The first railways in the United States were built by the Army Corps of Engineers. Hmm. They weren't built by private interest. This was in this period, now the 1820s, 1830s were the hmm. first ones. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I liked what Arlen was, was saying, and I uh I don't know uh you know how much you would agree, but but I, I think that the way the way I see it at least is that like the current system that we have now is like we we can see that it has nothing to offer us. With there is no mm -hmm. future with this current system. And so we're like looking for other solutions what has worked in the past um and so at least for me that's uh one of the reasons why i like to study these sort of old kind of obscure texts because i feel like the uh protectionist system is something that has uh worked a lot in the past but 
one thing we have to realize if we're talking about solutions and how to bring it about to, to stick with America as an example. Okay. You have somebody like Trump, for example, who called himself a tariff man and, you know, wants to bring in more protectionism, but under the American system of government, Trump can't bring about more protectionism, right? Like Trump is the executive. So, he can execute the laws that are set by the legislature, by Congress, by the House and Senate, right? So you also have to have an electorate who elects all of these people to the House and Senate on this agenda. And so you have to have a populace that is educated to this level of understanding what is in their best interests and then goes and works towards electing a Congress that is going to work towards those goals. And that is the real challenge of the thing. That is the work okay. that we have in front of us. Mm. Do you problem. think that his, well, well, do you think his tran transferring power to states um, <clears throat> specifically so that they can individually maybe manage development of different um, industries might be work a little bit in, in protectionism's favor? Well, there is definitely um, some areas where it's entirely appropriate for the states to set policy. But, you know, in terms of like importing duties and things like that, that's not something that's set by the states. That's set by, uh, by the federal government. Um, and, you know, issuance of the currency, control of the currency, a national banking system would have to, by definition, be a federal policy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, Sam, um, what, what I answer to what you just said, which was the currency, the national currency set by, actually you said something, I, I, it's, it went by for fast, but the, the financial... Um, control which is uh, vested in each nation that or, or each region that produces or has the control of the production of the currency so the EU has control over that whole region since Britain left and they went back to the pound sterling that is returned back to the British national government in Canada the Canadian dollar in the US the US dollar by uh, the um, uh, Federal uh, Reserve. Thank you very much. Yes, exactly. The Federal Reserve or the Bank of Canada in the country of Canada, or what is known as the country of Canada. So those controls are by each of those entities that are the national banks or the 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 institution that is given the authority to to produce currency. And in each of those in, in instances, the that control has a tremendous effect. Like you, you, we, we are, what this discussion primarily is, is about because of the book that, that, that we've read is about uh, uh, import duties and taxes and, and tariffs. But what is of, of perhaps greater importance and particularly in the local well, not even local in, in their in the national sense, that each of those institutions that control the currency, um, you know, uh, all of the different numbers that he said, you know, it's one point two five million for this, and it's sixty six thousand seven hundred and forty three for that. If your currency has been debased so that it is only worth ninety six percent of what it was worth a week ago or two weeks ago, or heaven forbid, 50% of what it was worth a week or two ago. Those tariffs start to kind of, you know, dwindle in their significance. And so the fact that these different independent uh, 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 corporate entities, privately owned national banks, Bank of Canada, Federal Reserve, uh, have have more impact on mm -hmm. the the wealth or the transfer from country to country like you know the whole tariff thing of we're going to buy 
buy wool from Australia or from New Zealand where, you know, it's cheaper and we're going to bring it in and we're going to use our looms and make wool fabric here in Great Britain because, you know, we're going to do the manufacturing and control the industry. Um, if if the National Bank of, of, of Australia or New Zealand has just, you know, done some some action to, to debase the currency by, by 20, 30, 40 percent, what difference is, does the tariff make at that point? And I agree so, with you, and and uh, what he's when he's writing here. Don't forget, they had already brought back the second bank of the United States. So national banking was a crucial plank of this nationalist faction in American politics. But they had already won on that plank, right? That was not something that they had to achieve anymore, and so they were fighting for higher tariffs and protection of manufacturing, which was the exact same issue that came up with George Washington and Alexander Hamilton that they were able to get a national bank and control of the currency but they were not able to get nearly to the same extent the protective tariff and the protective system it wasn't until Lincoln that you were able to get both and unfortunately it was during the civil war when a lot of it went to the exigencies of war and then after the war after Lincoln was assassinated very quickly, these networks came in to destroy the greenback system. But yes, control over your currency is vital and unfortunately something that is not well understood by most people. It's not a hot topic. It's not something of interest to most people, but it is vitally important. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, in fact, it is the, the, the pivot that... Um, Okay, so in the case of, of tariffs and controls and, and import-export issues to, to build and, well, to maintain and to build your, uh, the profitability of your society, of your group, of your nation, coming back to the point of nationalism, um, is, it, is it the first, the first pivot, the first most crucial issue that, that one, the one being the nation, the people, the populace, are freed from the controls, the artifice that comes from that national corporate, well, national, sorry, I used the word improperly there, the corporate interest of the national uh, currency, uh, currency controller being the Federal Reserve or the Bank of Canada or whatever it is in each of the, of the different countries. Um, with with an interest that I will argue without footnotes and everything else, but I will argue has has a direct tie to the city of London and that financial uh, financial uh, oligarchy of 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 the of of the strings of, of back to the marionette that each country and their and their uh, uh, national bank or Federal Reserve or, or whatever that presents as that. We're going to manipulate you over here in uh, Nigeria, and we're going to do over here in Spain, and we're going to do over here in in Canada or anywhere else to 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 control that that whole puppet show of of control, so that our discussion of tariffs. Now, please, I do not mean this as a uh, uh, criticism of the discussion of tariffs. I, I get it. I said earlier in two weeks ago when we were on with, with my wife, Cynthia, who's not feeling well tonight, but, but that we are manufacturers. We made leather goods. We manufactured high quality, high end leather goods. And the inundation of what was coming from Asia at prices that were like the furniture maker, where your wholesale price is less than the cost of materials. That became a reality. So yeah, they so should have been tariffed. Yeah, the, absolutely. Well, I, I, I think it's more complicated than tariffs. Uh, I, maybe I'm wrong. I, I, don't, I don't know. No, I'm just saying that example of, that you gave a few weeks ago. Yes. Absolutely, they should have been subject to higher tariffs to allow for the domestic manufacturer to compete. There's Except no question. Except that it wasn't, it wasn't, Sam, it wasn't true competition. In other words, well, I, I can't prove that. But my suspicion is that the product that was coming from Asia was not because they had lower labor costs, lower material costs, 
and they were still making a profit, which is what my point was about my example about the furniture was that it's it's not that they are in a, 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 an advantageous market that that they can get the labor, the materials, the cost of production, and that they can bring that down to such a level that they can come into our market and underprice the Canadian or North American manufacturer. That's not what I was suggesting. What no, I, I remember what you said, that they, was, they were saying that they weren't actually making a profit and they were trying to take correct. over our market. And that is, you know, we should have dumping laws. That's technically dumping. And, and we should have stronger dumping laws to prevent that. That would be another form of a protective plank to protect your domestic manufacturers against any government who's willing to subsidize that sort of thing. I totally agree. I totally agree. And and that and is, isn't education the actual pivot point or whatever that you're seeking? Because even if we do regain control of our own money printing, if we actually do have the national bank again, if we don't have the properly educated general population, then it will be easy for greedy men to come in and take control of it all over again. Yeah, My absolutely. Reference yeah. is that. No, I, I totally agree, Susan. That that's I think that that's the that's the bottom line that needs to be changed. Um, you know, but I for the life of me try to get that away from the government. Yeah, but gentlemen, everything well, you said you said are perfectly right but from an economic standpoint, but as long as you don't have a true national government, because everything you said, a true go national government would have passed anti-dumping law, would have passed uh, right tariffs, would have protected the core essential industry, okay? But mm -hmm. it happened because there were no true national governments at the head of those nations. And all those nations are... I don't know how to say it, are provinces of something that I call the Western Empire. Okay, so, and that Western Empire have has provinces, and Canada is one of the provinces. Uh, in, the, in the past, I would have thought that the U.S. was more autonomous, but I even now I reach the point that I think that even the U.S. is one mm -hmm. of the provinces of the Western Empire. And the aristoc well, not the aristocracy, not in the Platonic uh, meaning, but the hereditary plutocrats, okay? The hereditary nobility. Let's just nowadays. call them the kleptocrats, because that's, okay, that's kleptocrats. what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, okay let's, let's agree on the 2K, either kleptocrats <laughs> or cacocrats. Okay, so the case, <laughs> the, 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 the cacocrats or the kleptocrats, they are now controlling uh, that Western empire, and uh, they don't care about their specific provinces, okay? If you take the Roman Empire, for example, uh, the senator who was sent to govern Spain, they would loot Spain, okay? The senator who was sent to govern Syria, they would loot Syria. The governor who was sent to govern what is called nowadays Morocco would have, uh, 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 would have looted Morocco, okay? And they would come back to Rome uh, and they would be on the magnificent gardens and so on. And if you go on the on the beltway around Washington D.C., you will see a lot of mansions that have been built since the war in Ukraine. Okay, because uh, Ukraine is a kind of province for them too, and uh, indirectly they looted Ukraine and they managed to build some beautiful mansions that you can see if you mm -hmm. make a trip around uh, Washington D.C., for example. Uh, so uh, the only place so, in the country where the real estate market is on the up. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. as long as there are no true national governments, uh, nothing will happen, okay? Because all the uh, economic principles that we discussed tonight and the other nights are perfectly sound, okay? That's the first step. But the second step that you need national aristocracies that will truly work for the nation that they represent. Of course. And in an, in a democratic uh, system that means that the people have to be educated to know and to know how to 
find those and elect those people to get also them to become, into government but, to, but to become to those be people. engaged enough as well and not yeah. be distracted okay you know, sam to, sam to become I, those people as well yes okay. absolutely to either find them or become them themselves and but but also to be able to convince their fellow citizens to vote for them and not to vote for the guy with the slick marketing campaign or just whoever the name you heard on the radio because you're so disengaged because all you care about is your favorite TV shows or whatever and you're so distracted that you're not engaged uh, in the issues. I, I think that I think that's the first step, but I would like to remind all of you that the last time that the US got an aristocrat then the guy got killed in 1963. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, you can elect another one like him, but I predict you in advance that he will get killed in a way or another. Uh, so, uh, uh, I'm not saying that there are no solutions, but I'm saying that probably it will be multi layer as solutions. Yeah, I agree. And that's, that's really that's the, sure. the huge, that's really the huge question is how do you, how, how, how does the Republic survive? You know, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance that, that these forces, they always exist. So, like, how do you elevate well, the citizenry to a level that they're aware of this, that they're engaged in the fight, that they don't become complacent? You know, like, what happened in the 60s? You had um, JFK assassinated, then you had the Vietnam War, and you had Malcolm X assassinated, and you had Martin Luther King assassinated, then you had RFK assassinated. Like, the people just became completely demoralized mm -hmm. and, and just... They just shut down, and they w didn't want to engage the system anymore because they were they were they were suffering all, like PTSD from everything that had happened, and they just said, hey. "I don't I don't want any part of this anymore." Yeah. Right? But I I, I want yeah. to go back to what Arlen said the uh, fifteen minutes ago. I think it's time for a second American Revolution. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I didn't. I it's didn't one, say it's one thing to be informed. You have to be prepared to stand Ar up Ar and fight at some point. However, you can do that. Arlen, what, 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 okay. However, okay. Yeah. Right. Look at so, <laughs> so I, think, right. I think I think the issue. I think the issue is number one. I, I didn't talk about. I wasn't suggesting a second American Revolution. I think it was the consciousness of risk that I was bringing to the fore, and so. Um, there's many things that everyone has said that is tremendously valuable and important. And, and I think that the, um, the, the consciousness that is in the people that, that are, are speaking here and bringing on, on all levels is tremendously valuable. So, uh, Sam, I believe it was you who said, or who, who asked the, the question, or who, who put forward that it was it, it was education of the the masses of the of uh, of the citizenry to be able to stand with a a determination of I think this I think that and then they would vote or they would you know put forward that educated educated consciousness to their uh, elected official to to bring bring about a change and. Right now, I personally, I think we're way past that. I think that the the spoils that are the positions of, of governance and of corporate uh, corporate interest at the level of the nation, as in the corporation that is Canada, the corporation that is the United States, and the corporate interest. Uh, that controls that entity that is not now I may be straying and I may be showing my tinfoil hat or whatever at the, at the moment and, and I will take whatever criticism anyone brings but the action of the governance right now is not representative of the people and so I think there's an a, there's a discord there's a dissonance between what yes. the people on the ground, boots on the ground, on the on the earth, the ground, getting back to the point about Jefferson, which I don't necessarily completely believe, but his comment about that the that those that till the earth 
I, I listened to the same podcast that you were mentioning from Anton, uh, Sam, mm -hmm. about those that till the earth and grow the food are like the, they're like the expression of godliness or somehow closer to a, a heavenly uh, countenance than those who manufacture. Now, I've been on both sides of that. I have been behind the sewing machine, been behind the, 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 the press to, to, to make a, an article and, and manufacture something. And I've been on the other side where I'm literally tilling the soil and growing my, my livestock to, to produce from the earth, the, the, the generation, the, the generative force that is God given to the, the, you know, the sun, the, the, the plants, the animals, everything. And I think that there's a tremendous value in what Jefferson said, although it may have been mis misplaced, about the value of being connected to the earth and its production. So, colon, moving on. The, um, oh, shucks, now I got distracted. Um, you said we moved past the... Quan, Quan or Sam, please remind me. Um, yeah, no, our, I think, current, I, I, our current I, I, system where we currently are. Yeah, and, it's uh, we right. passed, okay, passed okay, okay. I got it. Thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you. I, I got it. So, so the the point about the corporate governance and that the will of the people, the voice of the people, that that what is needed is this great education, this great uplifting of the people, so that the people can speak with a true voice and achieve their true goal. That's the dissonance. That's the disconnect. That that's not happening now. Uh, like like if anyone yes is, it is, is yes it is it's it, happening it's, right here it's happening no, it's right not. here no no okay. it's going to happening in our discussion. it's going to take a bit for us to literally take back our educational systems no 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 but we're beginning no, no, that right here and only no. the most naive fool Arlen would argue that it's not a ton of work that has to be done an absolute ton of work but there is there's no, never but, been but, less uh belief in the system we have all kinds of technological tools at our disposal right now like look at us right now we're on we're in all corners of the earth right now all talking together means of networking and discussing We've never had more advanced tools than now. So there are some advantages. And yeah, the system is completely discredited in the minds of more and more people. Um, but yeah, no question. There is so, so, so much work to do. There's a mountain ahead of us we have to climb. I, 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 I guess I, 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 I diverge on the point of the mountain of work. And what I mean by that is... I actually believe, perhaps falsely or foolishly, that the people, the thing that is the people, the true voices across the world, across Australia, across Europe, across Canada, America, that the people on the ground, again, getting back to the boots on the ground, the true voices, those voices are not being represented in governance that's not a flaw of the people. Well, it is, but it, it's, it's, it's at the level of the disconnect. And so what I mean by that is, I believe that the people of, of, that I know at a base level are in the right place. The, 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 the heart, the, the intention is at the right place. It's that their intention is not moving the government. And that's the disconnect dissonance. The yeah. people are, are, are one thing, and the governance is moving in an entirely different direction. That's, that's, that's very the true. Issue that is and you know what? Nobody sees that more than the military. You know, there's a lot of military people. I mean, they, they see right through it right away, I'm sure of it. So I'm happy to, I'm happy to hear that. But, but the thing is that the, the awareness of the, the, the education of the populace, the education of the people isn't to bring them up to a level of consciousness that they're like oh i want a world that gives a better job to my my children and whatever and i'm going to what i said earlier about taking a risk that i'm going to take a risk so that you know we can have a better world in the future i, I believe that that for the most part that al already does exist to some extent although perhaps not in a conscious conscious effort of 
of implementing risk or exposing oneself oneself to risk, but that the awareness is there, the, the disconnect and the dissonance is at the level of when it comes to the people putting their stamp or their X on a vote to say, uh, representative in government, do this for me. That's where the break is. And so that the, the, the individual that is acting as the representative, as the, as the, the government um, uh, voice, that individual is not going by the input from the populace, from those that voted into power. Right. <laughs> no, well, no, no, I don't. I agree I, with you, Arlen, it, too, that, that, that it, it doesn't end at the ballot box, that you have to, once they get into office, you still have to stay on them and push them. No, no. Push them. No, 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 no. no, no, no you're not saying that. What are you, what are you saying, on Arlen? Okay, so that's that's not what I'm talking about. And again, you can you can put my tinfoil hat on and you can ban me from this forum and that's fine. But oh, the issue that's is the issue is that the individual in government, the senator, the MLA MP in Canada, is is operating from a, 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 an interest that is not the populace, the whole notion of but oh, why, do but why? I, because they're corrupt, like the people we have now. No, or even no. if we elect a humanist, you know, Republican, protectionist, whatever. Are, you Arlen, call them. Are, are you are you talking about aliens? No, I am oh, not talking about aliens. Holy cow! I am talking. I am <laughs> talking about men, men and women. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about men and women who are put into a position of power yeah that the the essence the, the the fuel of their power does not come from the populace oh okay the so what happens yeah, there's a disconnect the decisions yeah, sure. that they make the decisions yeah. that they that they make and the directives that they choose are not based on the people that put them into that position yeah, but for why? Sure. we know right. that for sure. but, it's but, a completely captured yeah. There's nothing tinfoil had about that one, right? No, but I, I, right. I, I want to understand. Tinfoil in any way. Hold on, I want to understand though, because Arlen's saying that even in an ideal situation, where we do elect a good person or or, or an entirely yeah, good the, body of representatives, oh, you're saying that, you're saying that still, even in that ideal case, they will not work towards the interests of the people who elected them, and will not work towards this agenda. And why? Why in its is current in its current state, the current state of governance as we know it? And this is the tinfoil hat part. It's not tinfoil hat. I did say that correctly. It's not aliens. It's not some magical, you know, whatever bizarreness. It's not that. It's just that the same entity that is has the interest in the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Canada, that entity is also the entity that owns and controls the governance, which is oh. a mm -hmm. private but corporation. Alan, mm -hmm. Alan, 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 no, no, yeah, we, Alan, we definitely I, agree I have, with you there, Arlen. Yeah. I have a, Again, Arlen, I have no a mystery. Name. No, no, but I have a name for that, Arlen. Okay, it's not at which all tinfoil. Mean? Okay, but if you're tinfoil, I'm tinfoil too, because... I have a name for that entity, Arlen. It's called the KFC Azael. Okay, it's the techistocratic feudal conglomerate of the anglo zio American establishment. Okay. Yes. So that's a yes. good one. Uh, so there yes. is nothing. There is nothing mad in what you said. It's basic geopolitical analysis. Mm. Okay. Well, th th but Quan, Quan, the, one of the words you just said that is a flaw. I, I that in my mind is a flaw. I, I apologize if it's if it appears negative. It's not. It's in support. I, I want, it, I want that, to discuss with you. And that is geopolitical. Political. Oh. Political suggests representation. It suggests politics. Okay. And the issue, the issue with the KFC, uh, what did you say? Azael? Azael. A-Z-A-E-L. Azael. Okay. The KFC as AL are not elected. They are of not represented. 
Right. And so we have to stop. We have, that's where the stop, the halt has to be at that level. It is not at the level of the citizen who needs to be brought up to the consciousness of doing what's right for their country, of what's okay. doing what's right for their That would their help. Fellow. That would help, though. But that Arlen, but Arlen, yes. isn't that the whole point of getting control over the issuance of money back in the hands of a national bank that's owned by the people? Like, there's only two ways to do it. Either money is created by the people, it's controlled by the people for the benefit of the people, or the issuance of money is controlled by a very small number of people. There's only the two ways to do it. And when it's controlled yeah. by a small number of people, it's only for one reason. It's because they seek power and control and profit. Yeah, for sure. But, yes. But, but I ask a question for everyone, okay? The big question for the next 30 years, because my hypothesis that it will be a multi-generational task, okay? The members of the true rulers of the Western Empire will not sit idle because they wouldn't try to control their power, okay? When, and when I say politics, I mean power. I only mean that, okay? And power can be used for the good, or power can be used for a small minority. And, and issuing seen, money is power. I know There's great Sam. power in issuing money. So it's I, part I know, of that as well. I know, Sam, but the Federal Reserve is a group of private banks trying to pass for a public banks. Yeah. Do, do you think that they wouldn't relinquish their power like that? You would of course have to, not. You wouldn't have to push them out. I'm sorry. Absolutely. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. Something Matt tells me all the time. You have to play the long game. Exactly. That's why it's I like say ben it's multi-generational. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Aside, and, aside, aside from the issue of it being multi-generational, which it may be, I, I'm not arguing that I'm right and you're wrong, but what I've done in my, my, my life, my generation, so not beyond me, just, just here, is transfer that, uh, uh, that, force and power that is the voice of such an one as the singular man that is Arlen. I have, I have managed in, in my generation to transfer that away from the corporate governance and the, well, I haven't gotten fully away yet from the uh, corporate control of my finances, my dollars, um, ex except that um, if, if, if my continuation and those around me can affect a change where they stand with their voice outside of that corporate interest, but as the man, again, I keep saying the same phrase about boots on the ground, feet on the ground, and a, an alive individual, uh, who, who is allegedly what a citizen is, but let's, let's leave that for now, um, can, can, can enforce the impact of their energy into the world as being for the interests of, of that individual man, i.e. me in my case, or any of you in your cases, that you can separate that force of, of energy of your individual being separate from the corporate corporate interest, the corporate being, the corporate citizen, the the corporate fi fiction name, person, all of those things that go into that tinfoil hat container, but that we stand and 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 elect that we elect we elect, elect is to to cause the change of your individual intent that you elect that your voice, your space, your place, your standing in this world right now, not generations in future, but will be that of the interests of, of myself and those around me, my, my community, my, my family, my tribe, my community, my nation, I, I don't think we have to wait generations. I, I think I think that the, the that the fulcrum that this this 
falsity, this fiction of corporate governance, corporate finance, corporate um, corporate everything is is so uh, uh, fragile that I don't uh, I disagree with with you, Quan. That that is it is not twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, sixty years. It's now, especially given the, the lay of the land, and I'm not talking about some QAnon uh, notion of, oh, there's all these forces over here that are changing things that we just don't know about and all these things. No, no, forget all of that. It's just you. It is each one. What are you doing? What, what risk are you willing to take? And I take that risk. I, I go out into my world. I do things. And there is change. I can talk about it and tell you and show you if you want. I don't want to hog. I've hogged more than enough. But stand up, speak, act, be in your convictions, and you will manifest change beyond your imagination. Very true. I'm inspired just to be here in this group with everyone and discussing this uh so thank you thank you everybody yeah. who who's here and who does care who wants to work towards you know the better future we're discussing here and um yeah it's a big task we have in front of us and uh, don't don't be scared it'll be it'll be tough but it'll be exciting and and fun too that's for sure. We one of the we we in one very exciting episode of Universal History, and I'm very grateful to be alive now. It's more exciting yes. every day. The yes. G twenty that just happened with everything that happened there was yeah hugely revelatory of the current state of things of the the global South, you know, and the rebellion that's going on against the uh, the this this in neoliberal free trade hegemony that we've had for the last 50 years. Yeah. Uh, forgive me to be a little bit pedantic, but uh, I would not say rebellion, because if we say rebellion, we acknowledge the, the kleptocrats as the masters. We should say declaration of sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good point. Mm. I wanted to say that everything that Quan Lee talks about, about true epistemological growth is a huge part of this yeah. and I for one needed to receive this education that I'm receiving from these lectures and these readings so that when I do talk to others I'm doing it with a little bit more wisdom and understanding than I would have before but in a lot of what you were saying, Arlen, I, I, I typed it into the chat. Did you ever watch the Matrix movie? Yes. Yes, I did. So that scene, I think it's near the end where Neo finally understands his power and he just raises his hand and says, no. And the bullets fall to the ground. My husband has often brought that up to me at times that I was really struggling. And that is what we are all doing right now. We are all recognizing our own power and authority, and we are standing up and saying no, and we are pushing back. And all over the world, in all kinds of ways, people are waking up and getting activated and pushing back and saying, no, you're not going to control us anymore. You're not going to control our money or anything else. We are bringing change to this system. And yeah, we have a lot of work ahead of us. But it is exciting because we are going to see our world transformed. Yeah, Susie. I love that, Susie. Yep. Susie, I, I, agree, with, I agree with your points. And I think that there's one element... I, I write a sub stack and, and, and where um, I've been I'm, 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 I finish ahead, your thought, Matt. but just so you guys know, I, I have at 12 o'clock at midnight, a TNT yeah. interview in Australia. So I'm, I'm going to have to, 
slow your but but finish yeah, your thought. Stop after yeah, no, that. no, finish your thought, Arlen. I just want to, to, to make God to the home. Not not to two, two <laughs> minutes or less on the for the country. Yeah. Two minutes or less. Okay, so so I've been writing and in writing, I'm sure Matt, you know about this, that as you write stuff, you really start to process thoughts and, and, and you you work through a lot of things that you know, even in just thinking and talking, you don't get through. But in law, there are three levels of, of um, uh, significance. One is what you say. I'm going to cut your lawn on Monday. Okay. Number two, you write it down and you sign and you get it stamped and all the different things you do to certify and, and notarize and, and quantify that I'm going to cut your law on my lawn on Monday. And then the third is performance. And so Monday comes and goes, and I didn't cut your lawn. So what I said out the window, doesn't matter, it's irrelevant. What I wrote and stamped and signed and quantified in whatever other way, certified, out the window. But what I did, my performance, is what it all amounts to. And so when it comes back to this issue of where we are in this consciousness of corporatism, corporatocracy, that each such and one is what? It is a corporate entity, is a corporate fiction. You are what you do. And if you act in the capacity of any aspect of the corporate fiction, then that is what you are acting for and as. And no matter what you say, and no matter what you write, goes out the window is irrelevant. And so we must do, we must be the people, the belief, the action that we're talking about that gets us out of this position of being the underlings to the superior uh, political class, the governance that tells us what to do. It is the action of doing and acting and taking risk to get out from under that. It's understanding the actual definition of integrity. And it's taking back our integrity as well. Our wholeness. We're working on it. Yep, Guys, that would we're going to get comment. there. We're working on it. And we have been for quite a while. I think that that's, and that's we're a good empowered place to, I think, close up today's session. And I think, yeah, it, it, there's a lot definitely to chew on. A lot of, I mean... It, Real knowledge is, is subjective. It's not simply us thinking in an ivory tower about beautiful ideas, but always thinking subjectively, how do these ideas that I've discovered that have been transforming world history um, change how I, I see myself and my relationship to a process I was born into and that I'm going to uh, have an effect upon in a negation or positive sense while I'm alive, right? That's going to reverberate beyond the the limitations of our lives. We all have this this sort of subjective reciprocity with the universe as a whole. So that I think this is great. I'm really I really do cherish these little meetings that we have here every week. So I'm looking forward to the next one. I think mm -hmm. Marty Seif actually Martin agreed to do a little uh you know off the cuff presentation next week on something I'm not fully sure. Anyway, Martin's always interesting to listen to. So. That'll be next week, and I think this Sunday we have something on uh, by Richard Cook, a, a NASA whistleblower who's done some interesting work on banking and some stuff on the American system too. And he's going to speak uh, at, on Sunday at two p.m. about his new book. So we've got a lot to uh, to chew on. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Wow. Just, yeah. Just a minute, Matthew. A quick one, a quick uh, uh, question. The uh, yes. the Sunday one that had Michael Claridge presenting. I didn't upload it yet. I'm I'm going to do it. Was a something. couple of weeks ago. Okay, okay, yeah. I okay. quanted last week. I'm yeah, looking forward to that one. It, so that's fine. That's I'm fine. falling behind. Yeah. yeah. I'm looking forward to Quan's too. Quan yeah. yeah. delivered a masterpiece. Oh, it's, uh, yeah, it's coming. It's coming. Okay. Beautiful. I can't wait. It's tough it'll for be, me on music Sundays, to your ear. but uh, I can't wait. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Okay, folks. Catch you yeah, next Thursday you, or Wednesday. It is your time. Bless you. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye, Good night.